and a very warm welcome to each one of you at the nice global conclave from the laps of the beautiful Himalayas where the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is located. The think tank was established in the month of February in the year 2016. It undertakes independent research in the field of international relations, foreign policy, security studies, and development. NICE has four research centers, China studies, neighborhood studies, non-traditional security studies, and security and strategic studies. The institute focuses on eight research topics, climate change and energy, global governance, sustainable development and smart cities, refugee and migration, China's Belt and Road Initiative, border and transboundary water politics, Indo-Pacific affairs, disaster management, and international economy and development. Previously, NICE has had the opportunity to host distinguished speakers from all around the globe. It was a great pleasure inviting me to speak here at NICE. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak with all of you. Well, thank you anyway, and I certainly admire the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you all. NICE Global Conclave is the flagship event of Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. The theme of the three-day conference is connecting Nepal to the world with the aim to bring the leaders, diplomats, business leaders, and scholars from all around the globe. The objective of the conclave is to introduce Nepal to the world and at the same time, update the Nepalese policy makers and experts about the fast changing geopolitics which will help Nepal reshape its foreign policy to achieve its national goal. This is the fourth session of the conference titled Future of Quad and Maritime Cooperation in Indo-Pacific. And to chair and moderate this session, it's a real pleasure to have Major General RPS Padoria here with us. Major General RPS Padoria is head of Center for Strategic Studies and Simulation at United Service Institution of India, New Delhi. He served the Indian Army for 36 years and has a vast experience in anti-terrorism operations, both as policy formulation and execution level, and has commanded a mountain division and brigade. He has held many prestigious staff appointments at command and army headquarters. Without further ado, I request the chair to take over. Uh, thank you very much. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you all for joining the session on future of Quad and maritime cooperation in Indo-Pacific, uh, being organized by Nepal Institute uh, for International Cooperation and Engagement. At the outset, I want to thank Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, the executive director, for inviting us and putting this together. We have a very distinguished panel uh, to discuss a grouping in the region, which is becoming the center of gravity of global politics and economic activity. Uh, I'll be requesting the panelists to make their initial remarks for about nine to 10 minutes. Uh, that will leave us with about 30 minutes for the question and answers. Organizers will be collecting the questions from the chat box and the Facebook, and I will then direct them towards the concerned speakers. Uh, we have to stick to the time, as we all know that we, we, they are having back-to-back -back sessions and probably we are already running uh, slightly late. Uh, let me now introduce the speakers who otherwise are very well known in the strategic circles. Uh, the first one is Admiral Yoshi Koda. He retired as the Vice Admiral of Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. Uh, the Admiral has served as Commander-in-Chief Self-Defense Fleet from 2007 until his retirement in 2008. Uh, from 2009 to 2011, Admiral became a senior fellow at Harvard University's uh, Asia Center, uh, where he worked on the Chinese naval strategy. He has served 
as an advisor to the National Secur Security uh, Secretariat. Then we have Dr. John Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee is a senior fellow as, at Hoopson Institute and adjunct professor at the Australian National University and University of Sydney. Uh, from 2016 to 2018, he was a senior national security advisor to the Australian foreign minister Bishop. In this role, he served as the principal advisor on Asia uh, for economic and strategic, economic, strategic and political affairs in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, Dr. Lee was also appointed the foreign minister's lead advisor on 2017 foreign policy white paper. Next is Captain Sarabjit Singh Parmar. Captain Parmar is the executive director at the National Maritime Foundation, New Delhi, India. Captain Parmar was member of the 11th Indian Antarctic Summer Expedition in 1991. He has commanded two ships and a naval squadron. He represented the Indian Navy in the first international hostage conference held in United States. Uh, Captain Parmar has worked as a research fellow at the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi, and also as Director, Strategic Maritime Assessment and Doctrine Development, and has completed the Doctrine Development Plan of the Indian Navy. Then we have Mr. Michael Shubridge. Uh, Mr. Michael Shubridge is the Director of Defense Strategy and National Security Program at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. He was a senior executive in the defense organization and has been deputy in two defense intelligence agencies, that is DIO and ASD, ran the defense, the intelligence and the research coordination division in prime minister's department. He led the team that produced the 2013 defense white paper and brought the Australian defense, uh, Australia US defense trade treaty into force in 2012. And then we have uh, Dr. Odgard, uh, she is a senior fellow at Hoopson Institute. She has been a visiting scholar at institutions such as Harvard University, the Wilson Center, and the Norwegian Nobel Institute. She is the author of numerous monographs, books. She has peer-reviewed articles and research papers on Chinese and Indo-Pacific security. She is a frequent commentator on these issues in the media. Dr. Odgard, recent publications include European Engagement in Indo-Pacific, the interplay between institutional and state level naval diplomacy, uh, published in October 2019. And the other one is Europe's place in Sino-US competition, published last year, 2020. Now, uh, before I hand over to the first speaker, very briefly, let me set the stage by highlighting a few aspects about the Indo-Pacific region and the Quad. The Indo-Pacific region's economic resurgence has shifted the global economic and political center of gravity towards this region. The majority of the world's trade passes through Indo-Pacific region, and it includes seven of the world's largest economies, namely China, Japan, India, South Korea, Australia, Indonesia, and of course, United States. Uh, we are wit witnessing increasing competition around the world in general, and more specifically, in Indo-Pacific for rule setting, creation of new norms, and reordering of global economic and security architecture. Middle powers are coming together on issues of common national interest. And what comes to my mind is India, Japan, Australia, uh, Indonesia, and re, uh, other countries in this region. Uh, China is the largest economy in the region and the largest investment and trading partner. Economic partnership with China is an attractive proposition for most of the countries in the region, but its growing military capabilities and reach constrain the strategic space and increase the threat perception of its neighbors. The US-China relationship is at its lowest point in decades. This region has therefore become the central theater in the competition between United States and China to shape the course of 21st century. Uh, more than ever before, America's place in the world will hinge on whether it can get the Indo-Pacific right. Uh, now, a word about Quad. Uh, it was in 2004, as we know, that these four nations came together within 14 hours to put in place a task force to 
to undertake HADR missions in the wake of tsunami that caused huge loss of life and property in the region. And uh, China was also China also assisted uh, these four countries in carrying out their mission. Right. Uh, then moving on in 2007, uh, Prime Minister Abe, in his speech titled "Confluence of Two Seas," delivered in the Indian Parliament, said, and I quote. By Japan and India coming together in this way, the broader Asia will evolve into an immense network spanning the entirety of Pacific Ocean, incorporating United States of America and Australia. Open and transparent, this network will allow people, goods, capital, and knowledge to flow freely. President Trump resuscitated Quad in 2017, but in 2021, it has been taken to the next level. And we have had first virtual summit between the leaders of the Quad countries very early in Biden administration's term. And the prospect of second summit uh, at the end of the year are very high. This is remarkable progress. In spite of this, many believe that Quad is still defining its purpose, while it may be true, but we also see convergence of interests and shared challenges. If we look closely, Quad is undergirded by the US alliance system and a network of trilateral arrangements between Quad partners. In addition to the trilateral, the Quad partners have been strengthening bilateral relations uh, through arrangements like two, two plus two meetings, that is between the external affairs and defense ministers. Uh, other than the Malabar excise, there is little that can be pointed out as Quad initiative to form a security partnership as of now. Undeniably, an assertive and belligerent China has been the factor behind the recent impetus given uh, by this grouping. But members still have differing public positions and respect uh, with respect to naming China or taking an open position against it. Now I'll, I'll stop here and I will uh, invite Admiral uh, for his initial comments. Uh, Admiral, please. And uh, I would request you to, to just take nine to 10 minutes. It'll be very difficult for me to point out that your time is up, but uh, please stick to your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, General. And uh, I'm Yoji Koda from Japan, and I was just a sailor, not a doctor or PhD or professor. So, but I'll speak some Japanese private view on the maritime coordination by Quad. And the Quad, you know, what is Quad? Uh, of course, Quad is not an alliance or treaty alliance or coalition force, but rather it's a, just the conceptual multinational entity sharing some common interest together. So, you know, rather it's better to say a virtual multinational cooperative entity, that's the Quad. And also Quad is the gathering of four like-minded nation, in other words, Japan, USA, India, and Australia. And there are several things in common, like the de democracy, freedom, rule-based order, free and open in the Pacific, or maritime nation or maritime stage. But at the same time, there are also several things which we do not share. So the Quad is a kind of the sensitive entity that balanced the common parts and non-common parts and bringing those four nations together to the common objective. So Quad is really a complicated conceptual body. That's my interpretation. And recently, the major Quad activity is re represented by the Quad remote summit meeting in March 12th. And that was practically the first summit meeting by Quad leadership. And one thing that was very clear was Quad is not a 
security tailored gathering, but rather Quad make it clear that the Quad would try to deal many international problems together like the security uh, like the climate change or covid or you know the bringing the regional nations together to enhance the international security so if there is anyone tries to interpret quad as a tailored security entity that is not correct and also the during the quad summit meeting one thing that four nations made it clear was you know the quad summit meeting did not single out china now, of course china had been a kind of the common concern during the last one decade period or so so quad indirectly mentioned the china but key thing is quad did not single out china as a kind of the serious security threat so primary reason for this is the quads four nation agrees not to try to force india to take quad or china or quad or us or quad i oh no, sorry the, the us and china you know the, the quad tried to give india the more political and the diplomatic flexibility to maneuver among the quad mechanism and that is the kind of the quick summary or wash up of the quad summit meeting in march and of course china chinese response toward that was not as we expected or perhaps the exactly we expected china take a pretty hard position on the the quad summit meeting and china called it the new NATO in the Indo-Pacific region. But in, of course, in the Quad is not a NATO type, the treaty alliance meeting. But, the, you know, the Quad, when necessary, necessary means when we share the same interest or objective, we would come and maneuver together for the single object, the same objective. China interpreted the Quad as a kind of the counter China organization or entity. So one of the future subject for Quad to solve is how to communicate, better communicate with China for the objective of the, the Quad. And the, of course, having said that, one thing also made it clear by Quad is you know, the Quad has been paying a lot of attention or huge attention over the Chinese challenge toward the existing international norm. As General mentioned, you know, the China has emerged as uh, the challenger of these existed or established international norm. So China is, has been trying to do many new things, sometimes far out of the international norm in the international community. So that has been confusing the, the, the international community. And one specific thing among the Chinese challenge is the Chinese maritime expansion. So Quad in the future will be questioned how well the Quad will be able to manage the Chinese maritime maneuver or self lightest maneuver in this region or globally, perhaps. But of course, China has been the, the, the largest concern, but at the same time, China is not a 10 meter tall giant. Giant. Now, the, China is still, the, the, I'd say, especially the, in terms of military strength, the smaller than the US military or allied nations military. And also China has a one ge geographical disadvantage. That is the, the first island chain. Many people may interpret first island chain 
as an island chain around China, but not simply that. When we take a precise look at the island, first island chain stretching from Japan to Taiwan, Taiwan to Philippines, then Indonesia and Malaysia, Singapore and Malaya Peninsula. This means China is surrounded by this first island chain and two seeds, East China Sea and South China Sea. So key subject for both China and the Quad nation is which side will take the better use of this geography to control Chinese adventurism or from Chinese view to prevent the Quad maritime cooperation from happening. So we, we have always take the, this geography into account when we discuss the Chinese subject. And what is, what is for the future? You know, the Quad itself, I mean, the four nations are not good enough. Quad has to expand our communication and cooperation with regional nations like ASEAN. And also Quad has to further expand our communication cooperation to distant powers like the European powers or NATO or Middle East power or other powers, but especially the roles of Europe and NATO represented by G7 will be critical. And my last comment is, you know, the, you know, quote itself would function for the next 10 decades or so, but I just mentioned Quad needs to expand its communication to further areas. And when we re make a quick, quick review over the G7 summit meeting, just happened several weeks ago, you know that G7 this year was not only G7, but India, Korea, Australia, and South Africa were invited as a guest. And all the leadership discussed many things, say from the COVID, economic cooperation, but also as a regional matter or global matter maybe, that the G7 also discussed China, Russia and North Korea. So China is always sitting in the middle of our security concern. So Quad tries to deal many subject that would be a hazard for the stable international community. But still the China sits in the middle of those obstacles from Japan's point of view. So my closing comment is the four nations still having the some disagreement of the each nation's national interest. But when we, they really find out the common objective and common interest, we need to come together and work together and maneuver together. And in the middle and longer term, we have to expand our communications as cooperation toward regional nations like ASEAN and then Europe or NATO or several other areas. That was my comment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Admiral. And I'm sure your views would be shared and uh, you know agreed to by uh, many of the speakers and audience here. Thank you for those comments. Now, may I request uh, Dr. John Lee for his initial comments, please. And you have 10 minutes. Uh, Admiral was bang on time, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, and thank you for having me and thank you to the audience for logging on. Well, the relationship between the United States, Japan and Australia is obviously different to that regarding India because India is not a US ally and it does not have the same history of cooperation with the, with the other two countries. Now, to be blunt, we've always found, uh, and I can think I can speak for the United States and Japan as well, that India is a hard and tough negotiator. And the macro observation that India is a democracy will only get you so far. 
So I think the key uh, to understand the quad is to understand the obstacles and differences with India and to work around these differences. Uh, let me just name two or three uh, road roadblocks which which have to be uh, negotiated. And the first is geography, or more precisely, geo strategy. Uh, India's greatest threats are still continental, um, while the United States' strategic interests in the Indo-Pacific are largely maritime, uh, as are the Japanese and Australian, and it's still dominated by East Asia rather than India's periphery. The United States and the others um, does not have the capability to uh, involve itself in hot disputes in continental India, while India does not yet have the will and possibly the capability to involve itself in disputes in maritime Northeast Asia. Uh, the second roadblock we have to um, negotiate is history or strategic culture. Um, the United States in particular seeks allies and partners able to deliver on hard commitments. Uh, while India seeks to maximise its strategic options and strategic independence. Now, these might sometimes be complementary, but they are not the same thing. India has never been part of the post-World War II US-led strategic order and doesn't have the same uh, conception of alliances and partnerships as many East Asian countries. Moreover, India is friends with American rivals and enemies, such as Russia and Iran. Uh, the third roadblock is economics. Uh, India might be the sixth largest economy in the world in normal terms, but it is ranked around 142 in terms of GDP per capita. In other words, from that perspective, India is still a poor country and it's not heavily invested in the integrated supply chains in East Asia. This means that India has less direct interest in putting blood and treasure into upholding a regional uh, liberal order compared to United States, Japan, Australia. Now, India still largely retains a largely continental strategic perspective, despite its growing naval capabilities. And this is not surprising given that its two main sources of disruption uh, are still Pakistan and continental China. Uh, the third uh, roadblock is institutional. India's institutional apparatus and resources uh, that it can allocate to foreign policy issues in relative terms is still some way behind that of the other Quad countries. And this, I think, still places some limitations on New Delhi's capability to develop and implement joint policies. However, despite all those three factors, uh, we are working out what we can get from each other. Now, all sides agree. Uh, that China is the problem. They may state it in different ways, but I think all sides agree that China is the problem and the Quad would have been reinstituted but for China or but for this perspective, even if not all sides agree on how best to address specific issues. Uh, I do think changes in mindset from all sides will be significant and probably decisive in driving cooperation uh, within the Quad. Uh, from the Indian side, China has always used its border dispute with India and its support for Pakistan to warn India that closer cooperation with the US and through organisations like the Quad will lead to China pressing those continental buttons. But I think India has finally come to the realisation that China will press those buttons regardless. So this means that India might as well pursue greater cooperation with the US and Quad countries uh, and at best, it potentially gives India new leverage and new options. At worst, India is not in a poorer position with respect to China, as China has shown that it will um, um, press those continental buttons regardless of the policies that India is pursuing. Now, from the American and allied side, I think there is a gradual realisation that they need to work with what India is and not project onto India their vision of what ideal cooperation looks like. So it's significant, for example, that the idea of helping India rise and allowing India to become, quote, a net security provider has come into fashion in the United States and Australia and Japan. But this is significant because it acknowledges that India will not always fall into the same strategic line. But if India emerges as a great Indo-Pacific power or Indian Ocean power, 
its structural differences with China will mean that a powerful India is on balance going to be a net positive for the United States and the other two countries. And importantly, this is something India is very comfortable with. Uh, given an understanding of each other's interests and limitations, in my view, meaningful cooperation is occurring and will continue to occur in the following ways. One, I think there will be uh, further enhanced Indian naval capabilities and naval cooperation in the Indian Ocean and the Bay of Bengal with the other three countries. Uh, two, cooperation on there will be cooperation on ensuring that the Bay of Bengal economies, especially Bangladesh, do not become irreversibly bound to China economically and technologically through the BRI framework. Uh, and three, I think there'll be increased uh, geotech and high-tech cooperation within the quad structure and potentially the democratic 10 countries, especially as it, re as it relates to uh, ICT, information communications technology, to artificial intelligence, to FinTech and big data applications. Uh, another thing, the fact that India isn't a, an American ally or a fully industrialized economy uh, can actually lead to an unintended diplomatic virtue. It gives the Quad grouping more standing and credibility in many ways in Southeast Asia. Uh, Southeast Asian nations, including formal allies, the Philippines and Thailand, formal allies of the United States, Philippines and Thailand, are sometimes wary of being seen to be giving up strategic and diplomatic agency to the US. And one reason is that this sense of their own smallness and weakness uh, when compared to the other great powers in the region makes them hypersensitive to any possibility of entrapment or, or the, the perception that they have given up their decision-making to an advanced Western nation. With a, a quad with Indian membership makes it more difficult to dismiss or ignore this entity. Finally, for the next couple of minutes, let me just offer this summary. That countries in a region are at different stages of understanding and responding to strategic risks. Most countries in a region are hedging and many are paralyzed with uncertainty or weaknesses. The Quad was reinstituted by four countries who have an advanced comprehension of the strategic risk and opportunity of proactively balancing and countering China's actions. Uh, all four countries of, in the Quad have been through a difficult strategic and political journey with respect to China. They all have very similar interpretations of Chinese blueprints, such as the Belt and Road Initiative and Made in China 2025. And in the case of Japan, India and Australia, they have felt the pressure and the pain of China's uh, coercive economic actions. In the case of India and Japan, they both face the martial or physical threat that China poses to them. And as a result, they're all heading in broadly similar directions with respect to China. Now, as a response, the Quad is emerging as a flexible, uh, action oriented and responsive grouping of four countries uh, with formidable national capabilities with each member offering uniquely important geostrategic positions on the map and assets on China's periphery. The Quad importantly is unburdened by tedious processes and has a built-in institutional surge capacity, if you like, based on strategic need and circumstance. So the Quad will become, I think, what it needs to become for the countries. Uh, the Quad is becoming a way for India to entrench itself into the strategic architecture of the region and for Australia to engage India strategically in a way that uh, would not be possible bilaterally. Uh, Southeast Asian maritime states are also becoming increasingly comfortable with the uh, increased relevance and role of the Quad and many are increasingly seeing the Quad as a strategic asset for the Indo-Pacific rather than as a threat to ASEAN centrality. The Quad is now a very useful platform to discuss and even coordinate basic policies in the economic, finance, infrastructure and technological areas in addition to the maritime and military areas. It may also become a useful platform to pursue limited uh, ad hoc intelligence sharing arrangements on issues that affect all four uh, members. The Quad for me is sufficiently flexible. Uh, it is quite an adaptable institution 
which wish to engage other powers, uh, seeking to counter some aspects of China's policies. Uh, and I can see the Quad becoming quite a useful platform to engage uh, countries such as Vietnam and even the European Union, or particularly European countries such as France, uh, when it comes to Indo-Pacific you know, maritime issues. Uh, thank you, General. I'll stop there and look forward to the discussion uh, after. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, for those comments. Uh, here, I would just like to make one uh, comment before I move to the next speaker, and that is Captain Parmar, and he may like to answer regarding India's focus uh, only on continental threat. Probably under this new uh, government, uh, things might be changing a bit. That's what uh, we are hearing, and that's what we have started seeing. So continental threat, we are now realizing that we have to be uh, you know, moving towards the maritime direction, and probably our future threats lie there. So we would like to hear Dr. Parmar on his, uh, 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 I'll request him to give his uh, initial remarks, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yeah. Right. So I'm going to keep my comments very short and uh, look for the quick fire round during the question answers. A lot of points have been covered, a lot of issues. I agree with Admiral Koda and Dr. Lee, but with Dr. Lee, I may have a little difference in opinion, and I think that we can have a friendly chat and agree to disagree, perhaps if required. Coming back to what you'd asked me about continental India and maritime India, I think the focus on uh, uh, theater commands, the maritime theater command and what the uh, defense minister said recently in his uh, visit to Karwar is a clear indication that there is equal weightage that requires to be given on the maritime, uh, in the maritime domain, as well as uh, on the continent. If we are to bear weight and defend our territory one, protect our interests too, and to ensure that we come out advantages. So there has to be an equal impetus, and I think that is being done. And only time will tell as to when uh, India is more uh, more maritime prowess than it has today, which even today is quite a lot. So it is time, but yes, there is an uh, emphasis on the maritime domain. Having said that, let me get back to the uh, issue at hand. and. I'd like to give it a little different tinge. Let's forget that quad means anything. Let's just say it is a term. Let's forget that quad means four. Let's just say it is by chance that in 2004, when the tsunami hit, we had four nations who came together, who were able to operate together, mainly due to the like-mindedness approach. And the main issue was to combat the threat and the challenge that tsunami had thrown into the region, which today, we call the Indo-Pacific. And that's where I would uh, like to remain a little focused. And uh, let's forget, let's just say the Quad is a grouping. But I'll borrow a line from Clausewitz here when he talked about alliances. And he said that alliances are either a body of equals or it is led by a hegemon. So let's forget for once that US is the strongest nation here. Let's have a look at the other three nations that form part of the Quad. And we will look at them as middle pass, but I'll come back to that too a little later. The whole issue, where Quad comes and we remain, say, China-centric and we remain focused on military power is because of the initial QSD issue, quadrilateral security dialogue. It's time we remove this term security. It's time we stop looking at it as an equivalence of naval power or an equivalence of only exercise by navies. We need to look at it a broader ambit of security, and this is what we call in NMF holistic maritime security, there are more elements to security that the Quad can do. And for that, you need to be inclusive. And if we call the Indo-Pacific a free and open and what India had added, the Prime Minister added the word inclusive, we need to be more inclusive. If we are to look at the Indo-Pacific, and Dr. Lee mentioned uh, different geo strategies and uh, nations viewing this area differently. And if obviously, everybody has their own threats, everybody has their own challenges. The Indo-Pacific is too large to be looked under one lens. We need to look at it in sub-regions. And if we are to divide the sub-regions, and let me extend uh, the argument by saying, let's start from the Persian Gulf. Let's look at the eastern coast of Africa, which has different dynamics. Let's look at the broader Indian Ocean region. We may look at it as the Arabian Sea in the Bay of Bengal, because both subsets, so both subsets of the Indian Ocean region have different dynamics. Look at the success in the Bay of Bengal. Look at where the Arabian Sea stands. You cross the Malacca Strait, you're entering South China Sea. Totally different dynamics. There are nations who are near, who are uh, uh, Indian Ocean uh, nations, and they are also Southeast Asian nations. See the quandary they lie in. Then we move across. We move across to Vietnam, Philippines. We come to say Japan. The East 
Asian or the East China Sea itself has different dynamics. You go north, you've got Kuril Islands, Japan has an issue. You come down south, you've got Australia surrounded by three oceans. And here is where geostrategy comes into play. Island nations generally are more secure because they have a body of water which separates them from immediate, facing immediate threats on the border, which India faces. And I give you the example of England in World War II. Perhaps if it was a continental nation, history would have been different. And I always tell this to my US friends, that if the Canadians had been like the Chinese and the Mexicans like the Pakistanis, your geostrategy, your outlook would have been different. And that is where if you IFP nations understand this aspect, they will understand where does India come from. And of course, we, we stand by a strategic autonomy. When you look at our relationship with the US, it's been a roller coaster ride, right from the days of independence. It's only after around the turn of the century, around 2000, when things started changing, we signed a lot of agreements, yes, but I'm uh, drifting away from my uh, main issue out here. So the idea is that the moment you mention navies, the moment you mention Malabar, the moment you mention China, the moment you look at Quad as a hard security, from hard security aspect, nations tend to get scared. What have the ASEAN nations been saying? Do not force us to take sides. They are in agreement that Quad does bring some amount of uh, stability or security angle with them. But they always say, do not expect us to take sides. When you look at their geography, we can understand why. Therefore, if we are to make Quad a success, if we are to see the Quad prospering, then we need to look at other security issues. Let it be economics. Let it be climate change. Some has been mentioned by Admiral uh, Koda, right? Let's look at the effects of climate change. Let's look at blue economy. Let's look at making the Indo-Pacific a favorable and positive maritime environment or a continental environment for all nations to prosper together. And that linchpin could be the quad. But for that to be the quad, you need to look at something else. And here is where I bring in the issue of middle parts, middle power quad. Most of the nations in Indo-Pacific, and if I take the definition of Bari Buzan from his, uh, from his uh, uh, regional security uh, complex theory, then I would say in the broader Indo-Pacific, Japan, India, Australia are middle powers. Most of the nations in the Indo-Pacific are middle powers. They may have a stronger variation or a stand within their immediate neighborhood like India has, Japan has, Australia has. But we remain middle powers. And if you engage middle powers, then on the same balance, on the same level, there's a better understanding. And therefore, I think it is time that we start to look at Quad Plus. And this is what Admiral Koda had mentioned. I'm fully for it. It may be too premature for it to come about, but I am very sure its time will come. So you need to look at other nations. Even in the meetings, even in the various meetings that have been mentioned, including Quad meetings, other nations have been invited directly or indirectly. So therefore, there is the doors are open. So if the Quad is to prosper, if it is to be an Indo-Pacific entity, then you need to engage more nations. And that's when we need to look at Quad Plus. And why do I say this? Let's just look at the four nations, US, India, Australia, Japan. You see the number of platforms, the number of exercises across the Indo-Pacific they engage in, and they engage in other nations. Similarly, other nations also engage, and I can give you some platforms like IORA, BIMSTEC, East Asia Summit, ASEAN++, whatever we had, ADM++, whatever we have, WPNS, SCO. You have most of these nations engaging each other on other nations on these platforms, including China. And let me bring China into the debate. So therefore, if these middle parts operate together, and then of course, US is said to be there, and we start looking at each other and we start engaging, there will be an understanding of interoperability and understanding of each other's threats and challenges, the ability to push the aspects on a common anvil. And this is where capabilities and capacities come in is that if we recognize the capacity of a particular nation and the capability of another nation, we can optimize the output into the security fields, which I mentioned, apart from hard military. And therefore, you will have a sort of a level playing field, if, if I can call that, across the Indo-Pacific. Indo All nations, again, you just look at the number of bilateral, trilateral agreements. Now we've got India, Japan, Australia. We've got India, Australia, France coming in. We've had the four quad nations doing a maritime excess in the Bay of Bengal, La Perouse with France. We've got a Royal Naval Flotilla coming into this area shortly. And then, of course, we're going to have engagements with them. So it's time to look beyond four. It's time to look beyond hard military. It's time to look 
at an acceptable aspect that all nations who are a little wary of the security element in QSD or in Quad itself to get them on board. And that, to my mind, is the future of Quad. And I would just like to end by saying this, that uh, uh, Dr. Lee, you mentioned net security provider. That's one point I had. You know, how do you define net security provider? I, I mean, I, I was a party to the revision of the Indian Maritime Security Strategy document. We attempted to define uh, maritime, maritime net security provider to explain to the world what we meant by it. But more importantly, nobody can do it alone. So therefore, it has to be a cooperative effort. And that is where, again, you need to engage more nations. Therefore, we need to expand Quad. We need to look at Malabar separately. Let's not mix it up with Quad. Let's not uh, frighten nations who, um, who may be a little wary of make, taking sides. How will China view us? We've had a long discussion on China. Therefore, the, the effort should be to make the Indo-Pacific and the sub-regions ensure that we have a favorable and positive environment that will enable the nations to progress together. And to give you an example, um, India's initiative on the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, I may call it, we have Japan who has taken on one pillar. We have Australia who's taken on a second pillar. We have France who recently come on board and taken a pillar. India is looking at one. There are seven pillars, five are taken. It's not that only one nation look at each pillar. So we have initiatives like this. This is all part of the Indo-Pacific. These can be merged into one entity and looked at. And everybody, and the, and the buzzword is inclusive. Unfortunately, on all, all statements by nations except India, everybody uses free and open. India uses free, open, and inclusive. Let's not make the Quad exclusive. Let's not make Malabar exclusive. Let's not make anything exclusive. Let's get more and more inclusive nations on board. I pause here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Captain Parmar, for giving the Indian perspective and uh, bringing out uh, what India can bring uh, to the Quad. <clears throat> we will discuss a whole lot of issues further because there are in the chat boxes questions like, will India shed its uh, strategic autonomy, a term which uh, is uh, changing in its character and uh, plenty more definitions are being given. So we will request you for your comments uh, during the uh, course of discussion further, right? Now, may I now request uh, uh, Mr. Michael Shubridge uh, for his uh, initial opening remarks, please. Yes, thank you. And it's wonderful to be uh, talking to this event. I was so impressed with the number of countries participating and also with the speedy development of uh, the NICE think tank from 2016 to now to be thinking uh, as broadly as you are, you are and be collecting such a diverse group of people across all the sessions is very impressive. So I'm delighted to be talking to you from a cold car in a Canberra winter night. Uh, I was thinking about Nepal wrapped around by Tibet to the north and India to the east, west and south. Population of about 30 million people, so about the same size population as Australia. But from an Australian perspective, we mainly think about um, India and China as at each end of the Indo-Pacific system. But Nepal's geography reminds us there's a central land hinge to the Indo-Pacific too, as does, of course, the India-China conflict on the line of actual control. So I, I think that actually will be quite relevant to the development of the Quad to think beyond the maritime environment and to think about that land hinge of the Indo-Pacific. But talking about the Quad and maritime security can't be separated from the broader strategic environment. So, you know, Indo-Pacific, yes, it is an important uh, part of the globe and an important concept, but there's been a profound shift in the broader strategic environment over just the last six months. And that big shift is a move from seeing the defining factor strategically as growing US-China strategic competition to understanding that instead what's happening is not some bilateral tussle between two great powers, but a much bigger systemic struggle between the world's open societies uh, and an authoritarian China ruled by the Chinese Communist Party that is gonna have a gleeful celebration of 100 years of authoritarian rule just next month. And this shift 
in this understanding is what explains that G7 plus meeting in Cornwall. Uh, it explains the NATO meeting around the same time and the series of Indo-Pacific meetings before those events in Cornwall and Europe. And I draw people's particular attention to the Japan-US leadership meeting, the South Korea-US leadership meeting, the Quad Leaders meeting, and before that, the first senior officials meeting between China and the US in Anchorage, Alaska. These all set up what we saw happen uh, in Cornwall. And this is a profound development and it has major implications for the course of the Quad and for the involvement of powers beyond the Indo-Pacific in managing the China challenge. The loose coalition of open societies, and it is an inclusive co coalition, uh, that are coming together in this systemic challenge already make up some 2.4 billion of the globe's population and about 60% of global GDP. Uh, there's an emerging alignment on a core assessment of China under Xi. And interestingly, it's building on a framework uh, that the European Commission developed. It's not building on a Washington one, interestingly. And uh, so think back to just March 2019, when the European Commission put a China assessment out in the lead up to Xi Jinping's visit to Italy, Germany and France. And this uh, European Commission assessment broke new ground by describing the Chinese state as a partner, a competitor and a systemic rival. It was a big step then to even introduce that third limb, the systemic rival, given the clear primacy in European policy for years, as in many other countries' policies like Australia's, on economic partnership with Beijing. But just over two years on from then, the judgment is really narrowing and the now dominant judgment on display in Cornwall and at the NATO meeting and at those leadership meetings I mentioned is that Xi's China is primarily a systemic rival and the areas of partnership with China are small and reducing. What, what does all this mean for the Quad? Well, the US, India, Japan and Australia are core drivers of this growing wider coalition. And all four have some of the clearest common assessments of the trajectory and implications of China under Xi. And the Quad is turning out to be exactly the kind of small working group that the new US President Biden and other leaders sees as invaluable to generate positive momentum. I mean, it's amazing to me that not even two months into Biden's presidency, he did what we'd all told ourselves was unthinkable, and he met at leaders level with his quad partners, Prime Minister Modi, Prime Minister Suga, and Prime Minister Morrison. And it's even more amazing that at this first leaders meeting, they didn't just have a dialogue, they set out a tightly focused action plan to combine these four nations capabilities and address key global and Indo-Pacific challenges. So action, on COVID focused around vaccine production and distribution. And I really think we'll see that accelerate towards the end of this year. Commitment to open rules-based order, not an order dictated by Beijing. And that's, that's an open order, not one centered on that single authoritarian power. And joint work on climate change technology and adaptation. And the last one, critical and emerging technology cooperation development, but also securing supply chains, which again, loops back uh, to China and supply chain vulnerability there. So the Quad is an example of what I think can best be described as fast multilateralism, just like some of the supporting triangles, the trilateral triangles under the Quad are. And one of the strongest, fastest trilateral groupings on the planet right now is the Japan, Australia, US trilateral. I think we'll see strengthening of others. But the G7 plus NATO and the US EU relationship will move slower than the fast multilateralism that is possible in groupings like the Quad. But the Quad is giving real momentum uh, to these larger groupings. And as a simple example, the Quad leaders, the fact that they had met in March and then they all turned up at the uh, G7 plus they help shape 
those outcomes. And it wasn't a coincidence that that happened. Xi's China is a force of convergence that's driving this broader, loose global coalition closer and closer together in ways that would surprise people if you told them this would have happened back in 2019. PLA modernization and power projection into the first island chain, out into the second and into the Indian Ocean would just accelerate cooperation. And interestingly, and maybe it's something to discuss in, in, the, in the discussion, I think further land border conflict between China and India will also tighten this grouping and tighten this cooperation. As a colleague of mine says, uh, coping with the systemic China challenge means we have to take much more interest in each other's problems and provide assistance in ways we haven't before. European nations' main value here is economic and political weight and participation in shaping rules and standards, whether it's on things like UNCLOS, the WTO, the WHO, or the Human Rights Commission. The convergence will grow as the implications of Xi's dual circulation strategy become clearer. That's all about increasing China's economic leverage over others, but reducing China's vulnerability to others. And that has obvious security and strategic consequences that will get harder and harder to ignore. Uh, you'll see that not just with the Quad, not just with ASEAN, but also with the entire EU grouping. So COVID, climate change, um, and China are all creating a positive momentum for cooperation that maybe was unexpected. Now, I'll end with uh, two observations. One is from an Australian colleague of mine, Richard Maud, um, which is that the Quad is about China. It is about balancing China's power and supporting an Indo-Pacific in which many countries have a say in shaping regional order. But that means not a regional order centered on Beijing in which countries have to defer to China's interests and authority. So yes, the Quad is about China, but it's inclusive. And the Quad and this broader open societies loose coalition that I've talked about is much more confident in its own directions and future than just a year ago. And you can expect a focus on cooperation within these partnerships, and that will strengthen each of us. And partly as a byproduct of that, lessen China's importance and contribute to that goal of that free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific. I'll end there to give plenty of time for discussion. Thanks again for the chance to be part of this fantastic grouping. Uh, thank you, Mr. Michael Shubridge. And that was excellent uh, comments, uh, particularly coming from an Australian, giving the shift. I can see a very distinct shift uh, in the Australian position. Uh, you brought out uh, the importance of the middle powers, uh, which we are all talking about, India, uh, namely India, Australia, Japan, and many others, like Indonesia, maybe Vietnam, and things like that. And uh, uh, for a change, you were naming uh, China very, very uh, clearly. I mean, you did not mince your word in saying that uh, China is the main uh, reason behind these quad countries um, giving impetus to whatever they are doing now. And it's a force of convergence, right? Uh, then also you called it as a systemic rival. Uh, so we will have more to discuss during question and answer session. Now, uh, the last speaker to give the initial remarks is uh, Dr. Odgar. So let me request her to give her uh, initial remarks, please. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to speak at this important event. I will talk about Europe's role in the Indo-Pacific, which has greatly expanded over the past decade. Um, Europe has built strong partnerships in the Indo-Pacific because it seeks to enhance its role in the Indo-Pacific economic and security arena. The EU is a global economic heavyweight, which is able to push back at illegitimate Chinese industrial, economic and human rights policies, such as intellectual property theft, unfair state supported competition and widespread censorship. And Europe is now starting to do so despite uh, China's economic uh, importance to the region. In the security arena, until recently, 
the European footprint mostly relied on French and UK naval diplomacy. In particular, France has taken the lead in adopting a hard power European response to China's growing presence in the Indo-Pacific. The French tradition of a strong and independent defense profile and the country's Indo-Pacific territories make it well positioned to develop a European defense footprint in the region. And by joining forces with like-minded Asian partners, uh, such as India, Japan, Australia, and include its overseas territories in base sharing arrangements, France helps to provide, prove the point that European contributions to Indo-Pacific security are significant today. Other European countries are slowly but surely joining uh, the French and the UK effort as witnessed by the publication of Indo-Pacific strategies this year, both by the EU, by Germany, by the Netherlands, uh, to mention a few. And these embrace and support a European security footprint in the Indo-Pacific. In 2019, I was deployed on the French carrier Charles de Gaulle's trip to the Indo-Pacific for a month. And already then, it was very clear to me that France is, a closely, uh, is closely cooperating with the Quad, even if it's not a formal member. Uh, the EU is not part of, of such efforts, uh, but the EU supports the efforts of member states uh, to engage with Quad member states and other Indo-Pacific middle powers by building strategic partnerships, by making free trade agreements, and by uh, increasingly implementing connectivity projects with what you can call like-minded Indo-Pacific middle powers, South Korea, Australia, India, Singapore, and many others. So in this way, the EU provides a supportive frame for individual countries and groups of countries that wants to go further and, and, and especially in the security and military field. All these middle powers, they partner up with each other because they're similarly exposed to security and economic challenges from China, and they need each other to establish unity, support, and also best practices in how to meet these challenges. At the same time, to varying degrees and in various ways, these powers prefer not to choose sides between the US and China, but to base their security on cooperation with the US while maintaining cooperation with China. <clears throat> and several of these middle powers, including Europe, also relies on using more low-key diplomatic pressures towards Beijing <clears throat> rather than a more confrontational approach. In Europe's case, because it's an economic heavyweight, and it's best able to use uh, this type of power to influence China. The policy coordination that took place between the US and Europe under Trump on establishing protective mechanisms against illicit Chinese practices, such as export controls, connectivity programs, etc., with like-minded Asian powers in Southeast and East Asia is continuing under Biden and is indeed strengthened. Such middle power relations in the Indo-Pacific uh, should be encouraged by the US. Washington needs allies in that region who are sufficiently strong to operate independently from the US and that can take action on economic and security challenges from China without calling on the US uh, before doing anything. Of course, independent middle power relations will mean that the agendas of these partnerships are sometimes not aligned with US interests. For, 
for instance, trade may be diverted away from the US in some areas and towards other middle uh, the middle powers and the instruments used to manage challenges from China may differ from those pre preferred by the United States. However, uh, such differences should not prevent the US from recognizing that the benefits of such relationships outweigh the costs. And I would argue that middle power relations are a necessary development in establishing networks between US allies and partners. And, and if this proceeds, it will add up to a formidable entity that is able to push back against illicit Chinese challenges to a free and open Indo-Pacific Pacific across a wide range of issues while at the same time helping to stabilize the tensions that are created by US Chinese strategic competition precisely because these middle powers do not want to choose sides between the two. So they're gonna to continue to find ways to also cooperate with China. I'll stop there. Thank you for letting me speak and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much for those initial comments. Now we still got about half an hour, so we are well within time. So what I'm going to do is I would initially just throw two, three questions. I bunched them together and uh, throw it before I let you all uh, request, I mean, uh, give your uh, final remarks. Uh, so my question, I mean, the ones which I've got from the chat box is one about the shared values, that is democracies. Now, not all countries we know in the Indo-Pacific are democracies. So in case we lay emphasis on democracy, wouldn't we be uh, excluding a few countries? That is one uh, question. The second one is what about the Pacific Island nations? Uh, so my question, this is to the Admiral and Mr. Uh, Shubridge, please. Okay. Me, right? You, you can. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah you can start, uh, Admiral. Okay, yeah, the, the democracy. You know, yeah. the, that's, uh, yeah, of course, say, when we say democracy, Japan has, I would call, Japoclacy. <laughs> and India has Indian democracy. You know, <laughs> very different. But, but but fundamental thing is you know say the individual rights or freedom or you know those, those things are you know, pretty common but key thing is you know the there are some medium area between democracy and totalitarian authoritarian you know the, the community and most of the what you call non-democracy nation belongs to this area in between democracy and totalitarian authoritarian, you know, the, the part. So say the, the member nations of Quad, when we make an individual or group approach to those, what we call non-democratic country we have to take all the background, you know, the, the situation of each nation into account and make a kind of calculated approach or strategic approach to these nations. And, but the, the best is, for example, the, I hate to you know, the, bring the name, but for, for example, Cambodia or the, what was the, Bien Chan, uh, the, no, the, the, those nations, the Laos and Cambodia, for example, the it's very difficult, but they still communicate pretty closely with Japan, because we, we do not simply exclude them, but we try to communicate. So, of course, you know that there are still the very pretty large barriers, and they the degree of dependence of those nations to China is much, much larger than the degree of dependence to Japan. But key thing is when necessary, Japan will be able to talk 
with those China friendly nations. So, you know, the, the, these are the, the kind of the, the basic approach and just you know, try to convince them the value of the, the democracy or the difference between the democracy and the, the, the authoritarian, totalitarian and the mechanism. So the, 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 that is my, you know, the, the, the thoughts on the, the, your first question. The second question, island nation. You know, the, the, there are a group of island nations, one in the Pacific and one in the Indian Ocean. And the Asia, and, you know, the Indonesia, for example, the, the, that, that's a big country. But still, the, the, I think many people have many different opinions, but my key point is, you know, the Chinese dependence on the sea lines of communication. Say China needs to import a huge amount of natural resources through Indian Ocean and through Pacific Oceans. So maybe my response to your question is a little off focused, but you know, the value of those island nations, you know, the sitting in the Pacific Islands and the Indian Ocean will be very critical when we think about the Chinese sea lines of communication connecting South America to China and connecting Africa to China. So, you know, at least in the security side or security point of view, when we see China as a rival or threat, the, how to keep those nations as friendly as possible to our side, that will be the, the key thing. So, and also the, the location of these, the island nations are generally strategic for, you know, the the many nations in the island nations in Indian Ocean or Pacific Islands are strategic. That's why, for, I hate to speak this one, but in World War II, Japan, US fought very, you know, the fierce bloody war or combat in those islands because the, the, the US or Japan that takes control of the, those islands will be in a strategically advant advantageous position. So I'm not saying that the, the, the combat today, war today, but still from the security point of view, the value of those island nations will be the, the, the critical for the strategic planning to both China and Quad nations. This is my answers to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Admiral Koda. Now may I request uh, Michael for his uh, comments because he's the one who mentioned about democracy and uh, to some extent authoritarian uh, regime in China. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you. Look, I agree with what the Admiral has had to say. But I'll just repeat that point that uh, the Quad and in fact, the Open Society's larger grouping. Yes, it's about China, but it's about balancing China in particular way, in a particular way, and supporting this broader region where many countries have a say in shaping the regional order. And that includes some important partners like Vietnam, for example. Uh, but it's certainly, uh, I, I think countries like Cambodia and Laos still have a strong interest in a regional order that is not centered on Beijing, where they and other countries have to defer to the single regime of China's interests and authority. So that's what I mean by this open, loose coalition. Uh, and working with partners like Vietnam is perfectly consistent with that, that approach. Uh, and I think the Vietnamese certainly see it that way. But then talking about the Pacific Islands, again, I think the Admiral uh, is exactly right. There's a highly strategic part of um, what's happening in the South Pacific now and uh, Chinese plans to use economic and elite influence power to exert strategic power and perhaps gain a military presence. I think the history of the Second World War that the, the Admiral mentioned is, is really instructive. But this point about a, this emerging understanding that this is a systemic struggle and it's not some US, China, Washington, Beijing struggle where we all get to watch from the sidelines, hedge and balance, cheer people on or hope that it doesn't happen to us. 
that same phenomenon and that same realization is going to percolate through the South Pacific. And there will be a shift in their current way of operating, which is, you, know, you see it in, in parts of Southeast Asia as well, which is, look, uh, strategic competition, as long as it doesn't spill into conflict, is great for us because we get more offers from the competing parties. Well, in a systemic struggle, that's not the case. The offer from the particular party, uh, that matters who it's from, not just who's bringing you the best offer. So I, I, you, we will see the Quad and uh, some of the important other powers like France as a Pacific power and a South Pacific power play an increasingly important strategic role, including in the small Pacific states and some of the small Indian Ocean states as well. Right. Uh, thank you. And uh, now I'll group two, three questions together. And I would be asking uh, Dr. Lee and uh, Dr. Ogard for their comments. Now, the first is uh, that we have talked about security and other issues like, you know, they're coming together mainly because of the security and few other things like vaccine and other things have been thrown in now. What about the economic uh, integration? We haven't talked about any kind of a grouping. Uh, or in, uh, going forward from here, or any kind of those kind of engagements amongst the court and maybe court plus in future. So that's my first question. The second one is, uh, are there any parallels to NATO here? Uh, because we do hear um, talks of uh, Eastern uh, NATO and things like that. So maybe five years, 10 years from now, do we see some kind of a NATO kind of a organization uh, coming up here? And the uh, next one would be the role of Germany and Italy, right? Uh, because G7 has just finished. We know what are the uh, views of various countries in uh, G7 as far as China is concerned and also as far as Indo-Pacific is concerned. So may I request the views of uh, uh, Dr. Lee and uh, Dr. Um, Odgaard, please. Uh, uh, thank you, General. Um, first on the economic issue, I, I think I mentioned in my opening remarks that um, all four quad members largely agree on the intention behind things like the Belt and Road Initiative uh, made in China 2025. And I would note, particularly with respect to India, that even when, even before the quad was reinstituted, India was actually the first major e economy in the region, to my knowledge, to warn about the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so India is acutely aware of those things. And, and now with, uh, with, what, with what's happened in the last 14 months, in all of these four countries and others, but in all of these four countries, there's a national conversation about national resilience. And national resilience leads to a conversation about more secure supply chains, more reliable supply chains. Um, and, and I do think that the Quad members are ahead of other countries in looking at trying to cobble together a collective approach to more reliable supply chains, particularly in the technological space. So this is where I, I think the quad countries will, um, or the quad grouping will play a significant role uh, economically. You know, as I mentioned, India is not a typical East Asian economy where it's, um, it's heavily integrated into manufacturing supply chains and so on. But I think in that sort of tech space, and I mentioned a few things like AI, big data, fintech, 5G, 6G, uh, I do think the quad will become quite significant. And where you are getting a, 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 a divergence of supply chains, which is largely the sort of advanced tech sectors, that's where the quad will play a role. Very quickly, just on a NATO question, look, the easy answer, which everyone will give, which is correct for the moment, is to say, of course, the Quad isn't NATO. It's not a collective security arrangement. Uh, if one country gets attacked, it doesn't activate the other country to, to come to the country's aid, particularly when it comes to India. Um, but what I would say, though, is that um, if a dramatic event occurs, for example, let's say there's a war over Taiwan, win, lose, or draw, if China uses force over Taiwan, uh, I do actually think you'll start getting a very different conversation in the region about security arrangements and about security obligations. But until something dramatic like that happens, 
no, it quite doesn't come close to becoming a NATO organization. Thank you, General. Um, I would, uh, about economic integration, I think Europe uh, has very much the same concerns at the, as the Quad countries. So they are also engaged in building economic resilience and very much in, in building reliable supply chains and diversify uh, their uh, economic uh, partnerships and engagement so that they are less vulnerable uh, to, uh, to China. And so I think that that will, to a large extent, also uh, include uh, the countries in Asia and not just the US. And for that reason, Europe is also de facto a part uh, of that effort, even if Europe contains outlier countries that, that have a different policy. I think that will be the main, or that is the main trend in, in Europe. And it's also supported by EU mechanisms. About um, the question about NATO, I, well, NATO is, is a very rigid collective security engagement. And uh, even if you had a very serious security incidents in, in the, the Indo-Pacific, which involved Chinese use of force, I still think the security um, relationships would be quite different. Uh, I think today there is a need for more flexible uh, relationships and, and some people will group together and have more tight knit commitments. So some of the Quad countries may develop some kind of collective defense uh, structure, but I doubt that there will be uh, something like NATO in the Indo-Pacific. I think it will be counterproductive to making, making it an inclusive effort uh, to counter China, the, the, the policies of China that the countries agree are problematic. Um, so to me, uh, I don't see a NATO coming uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Germany and Italy, Germany is, of course, in contrast to France, the one that has been some more insistent to maintain more cooperative relations with, with Germany and has been slow to take on board that uh, Europe should have a security or military even footprint in the Indo-Pacific. But the, the changes that have happened in Europe could not have taken place if Germany had not ended up agreeing with France that uh, we do need to counter some of the, the malpractices of China also in the security and military field. And their Indo-Pacific strategy reflects that uh, because it does recognize uh, that, you know, Germany will also form maybe a small part, but they will also form part of some of the sort of naval diplomacy efforts that Europe is making. So I think there has been, a, a, and Italy is the same. So I don't, I think these powers, they may not be at the forefront of European efforts uh, in, in pushing back at China, but they will certainly Part, be part of it, uh, thus signaling that Europe is on the same page largely as the other Indo-Pacific middle powers in pushing back at China, uh, also in the security field. Thank you. And now the, the, the couple of questions are for uh, uh, Captain Parmar, uh, because India, of course, is a you know, people are asking a lot of questions about mainly about India's strategic autonomy and uh, the relations that India has with countries like Russia, Iran. So in a way, is that 
a hindrance to India's uh, you know, complete commitment to uh, what Quad is all about. And the second is, is India getting engaged with Quad uh, of late, meaning uh, last one year, one and a half years, uh, because of the standoff at the borders, uh, Indochina border. Is it because of balancing China that India is now talking about uh, Quad much more than what it used to do earlier? So these questions uh, and any other issue that you wish to highlight about India's role uh, is to Captain Parmar, please. Well, thank you, sir. So I'll just group all of that together with some more questions is uh, strategic autonomy. You know, it's it's something that I, I can understand is a bugbear for many nations to understand. But I think in the long run, it has helped, uh, helped India come the way it has in the sense that since independence, we chose to chart a way of non-alignment. Now we call it whatever strategic autonomy. Um, if we had gone either way, let's say we had uh, become a US ally, the road may have been different, but uh, I really don't know since we haven't walked that road, we really don't know where we would have gone. But given the circumstances of our neighborhood, I would hedge my bets and say that we may not have been very happy in the neighborhood. And then of course, uh, there is always that relationship with Pakistan. And it is possible that Pakistan may have gone the other way. It may have been seen as a Russian ally. So either way, we would have been in the same sort of uh, maybe cauldron we were born in. That's one issue. Insofar as Iran is concerned, I think every nation retains the right to see what is best for itself. For example, Iran was giving us oil at a much cheaper price than Iraq for the same quantity. That's a different issue that, of course, we uh, stopped taking oil from Iran. And uh, if, if I did my calculations correct, uh, the last financial year, Iraq, Iran dropped from our third uh, number three nation from which we imported oil to down to 16 or 17. So that is again international relations and this is where um, strategic autonomy and of course uh, uh, our relationship with the US came about. And as I said, in, let's take from 2000 and the number of uh, uh, agreements we have signed. We still have our differences. We still have our differences, but this is where I say when the question comes about uh, quad and democracy, I think the emphasis is more on common interests and addressing common challenges than the mode of governance of any nation. Give you the example is that we have seen uh, adversaries becoming friends. Vietnam, US is one example. India, US relations is, is uh, on a high curve today itself. So there are agreements that, so best is to agree to disagree and let sleeping dogs lie. Let's get on and let's see the best advantage we can accrue. So one of the questions was about all inclusiveness of what, Whoever or any nation who has a common interest or we are able to address a common threat, we need to have engaged them. And um, about, again, the number of nations to be included is, uh, I'll take a page uh, line from what Dr. Shubrit said. He called it loose coalition. Indians by nature strategically are averse to alliances and coalitions. So let's call it a loose grouping. A loose grouping of, say, now like-minded nations based on interests and uh, addressing common threats. When we discuss, then we look at smaller groupings who are affected by those interests and common threats, and we look at addressing them and going on. And when I said also that we need to carry everybody along, and if we concentrate on various aspects which have been discussed, whether it's economy, whether it's oil, it's trade, whatever it may be, automatically we will see that China will become balanced. We cannot change it. We need to get everybody together. Even if you have one or two nations who may not come along at that point in time, they will fall in line at some point or the other. But we need to balance China in all the aspects I've mentioned. That include your uh, BRIC, uh, BRI, you can call it the uh, Maritime Silk Road, you can call it its, uh, the method by which it is changing its uh, military power, capacity, capabilities. We need to address them. And um, insofar as, and I just like to take a little pot shot at some questions that had come. As far as NATO is concerned, Asia is not Europe. That's something we must clearly understand. So just by calling Quad an Asian NATO, it's, it sounds attractive. We can maybe also call Asia following the lines of European Union, but both will not be. Whatever it will be, it will be Asian. Sorry, I got muted. I got muted, I think. The values, the outlook of Asian nations are different from European nations. So. Uh, to call the Quad 
a NATO equivalent of a NATO or even a, or Asia equivalent of European Union would be incorrect. We need to form our own grouping. And that is for the nations to decide. Uh, insofar as the presence of European nations is concerned, I agree. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Otgen will, or God will agree that Germany for a long time has been trying to put a ship in the Indian Ocean region, but it's been unable to do it. The issue here is presence one and consistency of presence. If you are not consistent with your presence, you will be forgotten. And that I think we can take enough pages out of history, but there is one player we forget in this whole game of Quad and Indo-Pacific, and that is Russia. Whenever we have a, a discussion, we plain forget about Russia, we concentrate on China. China and Russia both have the same views insofar as the term Indo-Pacific is concerned. They don't like it. They don't like Indo-Pacific. They don't like Asia Pacific and Russia slowly is gaining access to this region. We've seen it happening. It's done a number of exercises with China, including one amphibious exercise around, I think, a decade or so ago, which is scary because as military men, we all know what is the reason for having an amphibious exercise. I mean, so Russia needs to be looked at. If China is going to have a say in Indo-Pacific, then of course, Russia is also going to go by it. When you hear uh, the statements made by Russia and China, it's, it's a very clear indication that they don't like this term. And therefore, if we are to make progress, we are to contend with both Russia and China together. Russia more so because NATO. And when you say NATO, it's the US. And then when Europe gets into Asia, you got half of NATO sitting in Europe in, in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, and then Russia is going to come in a string. So the game can get murkier, but it definitely will become interesting. And therefore, I go back to the point, and I think a lot of points have come out. We need to band a grouping of middle power nations. US is a member or is a part of Indo-Pacific, definitely. We need to get this going. We need to progress together. Automatically, we will balance China, and hopefully, we'll have a solution for Russia. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Captain Parmar, for those uh, remarks. Now, the time that I have is for the last comments only, and that would be, they will not be more than uh, two to three minutes. Uh, so uh, I would request the speakers to confine their uh, uh, concluding remarks to only about uh, two, three minutes. And uh, we will go in the same order that we followed. Uh, may I request uh, Admiral Kodar for his uh, concluding remarks, please. Thank you very much. Extremely informative sessions. And, uh, I learned a lot. And just you know, the, the quick comment, you know, the, uh, of course, Quad is not a NATO type, or at least you know, using the collective security in the, the agreement. But, but key role for NATO and Europe is really, like the, the Captain Palmer mentioned, checking Russia in Europe, make the United States to prepare for the two fronts conflict. When the Quad has to face against China, the degree of the military concentration will be very, very high or big. So if Russia wisely coordinate with China and tries to develop the second front in Europe. You know, US will for sure face the very serious dilemma of the resource allocation or military resource allocations. There is a value of the NATO or Europe keeping Russia in Europe and check the Europe by European NATO alone. Some support from the, U the USA. But well, this is what Quad, or at least Japan expect. Of course, due to the geographical separation, we do not expect too much military contribution too much from Europe. But key thing is the, the really, the enable the United States to concentrate their efforts only on this area. And the, the secondary front is that the, the business of NATO. This is what I think Japan hopes mostly. And the, the, the second thing, just, the, just 
quickly. The, you know, the really the, the when we say quad plus, the everybody all I think may mention that co cooperation with the regional nation will be another key for the success. So this is one thing we should not forget. But other than that, I think the quad just started and getting momentum day by day, month, month, month by month, but gradually and started working. I think we need to grow them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral. And uh, may I now request uh, Dr. John Lee, please? Thank you. Well, we, look, I think we all agree that Quad in the last two years has come a lot further than almost all of us expected. So that's good news. Um, but I would, the Quad still has to decide what it wants to be. Does it want to be just a discussion group? Or does it want to be a grouping that will actually shape the environment, deter particular countries, especially China, and counter particular policies um, um, that, that are against its interests and the interests of much of the region. If the Quad wants that shaping, deterring, and countering role, um, it has to um, include a hard edge to it. And what I mean by that is it has to progress to genuine military, genuine economic, genuine tech and diplomatic cooperation. But more than that, if it wants to shape, deter and counter, it needs to be prepared as a grouping, not necessarily in a NATO um, um, structure, but as a grouping, it needs to be prepared to absorb costs. It needs to be prepared to take risks, positive risks of action. And if need be, it needs to be prepared to impose costs. If it can do that, then it can not just shape, deter and counter, but it can also influence the hedging behaviours of most of the nations in the region, uh, which, 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 which is ultimately uh, what all four countries claim they seek to do to make sure that the environment is more conducive uh, to their interests. So yes, the quad has come very far, but there are uh, difficult, important decisions for it as a grouping in the next few years ahead. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Captain Parmar, for your concluding remarks, please. I'll, I'll follow the line what Admiral Koda and Dr. Lee have said. I think the, what Quad needs to do is to lay out a sort of a roadmap with certain uh, strategic pointers in between to ensure that uh, they have achieved some modicum of success. Hard security is one aspect, and I think we need to look at all the angles of security. And while doing so, along the way, we need to pick up uh, some friendly nations from this area who would like to come on board, whom we can, who can become part of the Quad, who are middle parts, who have a say, who can influence events, and also those nations whose capacities and capabilities need a little boosting up. If we do it bit by bit, then I think the Quad will actually become something which uh, of, of uh, some powerful entity in Indo-Pacific, which would be able to ensure uh, what I what uh, I had said earlier is a favorable and positive environment for all nations, and uh, it's I mean it, it sort of uh, goes by what uh, the, uh, the Indian concept of saga security and growth for all in the region. One weak uh, one uh, weak uh, link may deter progress, but it's not something that cannot be addressed. So I think the first thing is, is a sort of a roadmap and what Dr. Lee also said, decide what you want to do, but we need to give it some sort of uh, a timeline. It can't be endless. I'll stop here. Okay, thank you so much. And Mr. Mike, Michael Shubre, please. Yes, well, look, thank you again for the chance to have this discussion. I suppose I would uh, conclude by saying uh, absolutely the Quad needs to have a security element, uh, but I'd also say that the technological and economic parts of the Quad really work extremely well with that broader loose coalition that we can see emerging uh, in that systemic struggle. And that, that is the much bigger, more important picture. And that bigger picture, if she does not change direction and there is absolutely no sign, you know, to quote Willy Wonka from a, one of my favorite films, he shows no sign of slowing. That simple fact of that trajectory of China under Xi will be the single biggest source of convergence 
and the result will be we will all be surprised at the much closer, faster cooperation we see. I think that's entirely positive. And I think Europe is an enormous help here, not so much through a direct security uh, presence and role, although that's helpful, but far more as an economic and technological partner and a partner in re-engaging in some of the very important international institutions and standard setting of fora. So uh, I'm optimistic from the confidence that I see over the last 12 months, and I think that will grow and it will move in the direction that we've discussed. So thank you once again for the chance to talk to you. And I look forward to the success of the, um, of the uh, forum. Oh, thank you very much. And may I now request uh, Dr. Odgaard for, the, for her uh, concluding remarks, please. Thank you. Um, I would uh, comment that uh, NATO will continue to prioritize uh, countering the Russian threat uh, towards Europe, which runs all the way from the Arctic down to the Mediterranean. Um, but as we learned from last week's summits, uh, NATO does also consider China an important challenge today. And that kind of echoes uh, the efforts of uh, Europe and the European Union of the past years, the recognition that to have uh, influence on world order Europe does need uh, a footprint in the Indo-Pacific and it, it needs it in a, across a wide range of areas, economic, technological, security, and military. And even if it's not the EU itself <laughs> that has a presence, it does, it has in later years developed in a way that means that groups of countries can go ahead. It doesn't necessarily have to be all the EU member states. So even if some of the member states are quite pro-China, it doesn't stop countries uh, from moving ahead uh, and supporting, for example, uh, informally the efforts of the Quad, uh, from, from building economic uh, arrangements and, and other things that help uh, the countries build more resilience against uh, Chinese practices that are sort of undermining uh, the order there. So that would be my final comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we come to the conclusion of this session and we saw uh, that how the convergence of interest of these countries not only these countries but other countries also in the region have taken place their shared interest and uh, we talked about the uh, uh, importance of having a roadmap going forward from here uh, we also talked about uh, having quad plus getting all other countries also uh, on board and of course uh, the elephant in the room is china without doubts and that came out quite uh, clearly. So in the end, I would like to thank all the speakers for their excellent remarks and uh, the audience for their questions and uh, also uh, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal and Nice for giving, giving us, all of us, an opportunity to come together and discuss on this particular uh, topic and something which we are all concerned about and maybe we are discussing it. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, as we have come to the end of this session, we would like to express a sincere gratitude and thanks to the chair for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. A sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. 
Finally, we must also mention our deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making this session productive with your questions. Once again, we are truly honored to have you all with us today. Please do join us in the next session. Thank you so much.